Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for persisting. I think it was a deliberate ploy to put me up the last speaker before lunch because I normally go over and I see all the other presenters have eaten into the time. So thank you for persisting. I don't even need, know if I need to do this talk. I think I've just... Roger's promoted me enough, really. So <laughs> thank you, Roger. Um, today, I'm just going to do a small overview of the NEST um, 5.8 project which was a collaboration between James Cook University, the uh, Queensland Department of Environment and Science and Griffith University. I'm um, just going to touch on the marine end. And of course, we've just seen Zoe talk about a component of 5.8, uh, Project 5.8, and Alex will talk after lunch about the other component of 5.8 as well. And I think we may be showing a video of the pro project that we made at the end of this talk. I don't know if we'll have time or not. So I'll try and keep zooming in. Um, very much first up, thank you very much for the program, for um, supporting us over the last five years, particularly um, the Australian Government's Department of Environment and Energy. We also had a very generous contribution from the Queensland Government's Reef Water Quality Science Program, so thank you very much for that. And we also had additional support through our Queensland Government Advanced Queensland Fellowship to ZOE and additional support through the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority's Marine Monitoring Program. So thank you very much. We dedicated our final report to these two fine gentlemen and uh, that we sadly lost last year, and we just really wanted to acknowledge their great contribution to water quality. So the two research questions that I'll touch on now really we designed the program around what the landholders were telling us. So, you know, the key messages we were hearing, pretty similar in the sugarcane industry, really, is where is the sediment coming from, where is it going to, and what are the impacts? So we just really defined the key research questions around that. So the two questions I'll touch on is what is the influence of the newly delivered sediment on turbidity regimes in the inshore Great Barrier Reef? And how does the sediment change as it moves from the catchment out into the reef? What's, how is it that sediment transforms as it moves across the shelf? So I thought this is normally an end slide for me, but just to show that I do um, listen to the hub director's occasional emails. I put this up a lot earlier in the talk. This is our end user engagement and impact. Um, Really, during the program, we developed a lot of methods on how we can better measurements, measure sediment across the catchment to reef. So this includes the use of marine sediment traps offshore, um, you, certain grain size analysis that we can do to better um, characterise that sediment as it moves across the catchment to the reef, measuring the actual concentration of sediment in the water a lot better, and methods of sample collection. And I'll give a couple of examples of that as I move through. Using these methods, we have a much improved characterisation to better validate end of river loads. So we've worked very closely with the source catchments modelling team to hopefully better refine those end of catchment loads. Likewise, for the um, e-reefs model in the marine um, environment, we've got an improved characterisation of that sediment as it moves through the flood plumes and is deposited on the marine floor and resuspended and we actually provide a bit more validation to help refine the fluff layer within the e-reefs model. That's right, we've called it the fluff layer. We've had direct engagement with the Townsville Port Authority. We've had um, several meetings with them. I've actually presented to their little environment panel, and we've had a lot of knowledge transfer on the sediment dynamics within Cleveland Bay, and knowledge sharing. In the extension part of the project, Project 5.8, uh, we had a little case study program in the Whitsundays um, to address the per, uh, persistent turbidity issues down there where we collected samples from the seafloor and through the water column and our tracing data suggested that that sediment, there was no difference in that sediment in the water column and on the seafloor. So that persistent turbidity issues were <laughs> from resuspension of the um, seafloor sediments and whether that was newly delivered sediment from a recent river discharge or from the remobilisation of the different seafloors due to several cyclones in the area, well, that remains to be known. But we, we started the ball rolling down in the Whitsunday area and working very closely with 
sorry, I should say, we work very closely with the tourism body there to help co-design the project, select the sites where we're going to, and we're reported back to those guys. Uh, work very closely, as I uh, previously said, with Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority's Marine Monitoring Program, do annual presentations that incorporate the nest research. We also shared trips, as I'll show at the last slide, where we went out to Wild Reef um, to um, look at the water quality out there and collect the sediment, suspended sediment that had moved offshore in 2019. And in general, knowledge transfer and engagement to landholders, managers and stakeholders. So a lot of our key end users are in the room today. Thank you very much for persisting with me for the last five years. Uh, we gave sort of three to four monthly email updates on what we were doing in the program over that last five years. And it's really important, I think, to establish that catchment to reef narrative, like as we saw experience before in the LDC project, we're out there talking to the landholders, providing that holistic catchment to reef narrative to them and building trust that we've heard a few times today. So in our conceptual understanding, we're trying, as I said, emphasise that catchment to reef study, but today I'll focus on the marine, marine end. And my only method slide, we did the field study design from 2016 to 2020. We established a series of sediment traps and loggers, like you see there. And these loggers are measured, taking 10 minute readings, continuous readings of turbidity, light and wave pressure. And we also have the sediment traps. So these deployments typically are three to four monthly deployments over that 2016 to 2020 period. We selected a lot of sites, um, seven particular locations for these loggers along a longitudinal gradient from the mouth of the Burdekin River, an inshore offshore gradient in Cleveland Bay. And to look at a wet tropics river, we looked at a, site, a couple of sites off Dunk Island off the Tully River. Now, our first project was um, 2.1.5 where we started collecting a lot of data like this. And I'll quickly just walk you through this. So this is the Burdekin River discharge measured at the Clare Gauging Station. The orange um, part here is our turbidity readings from the loggers. The green is our wave pressure data. So the higher spikes represent the high energy wave resuspension type potential events. We have our light here in um, the white colour here. So as that dips down, that means there's less light available on the seafloor. And then we have our sediment traps here offshore uh, with the line representing the average sediment accumulation rate over that period of deployment. Now we got to the end of the, um, this 2.1.5 project and we we're like, oh, we didn't really capture a really big event from the Burdick and can you please help us extend us? Um, pretty please. And hopefully we can get that nice big event from the Burdick and well the great news is in we continued thank you very much for extension in 5.8 we got that big event from the Burdick and River and the localized floods from Townsville in our loggers and you can see there that that 2019 flood period co coincided with the highest sediment accumulation rates in our sediment traps um, low light areas and um, the highest turbidity readings we measured in the logger at this particular site. So this actually gave us that really critical piece of data to understand this process in the marine environment so much better for us. And based on our seven uh, logger data in the inshore Great Barrier Reef, we started to and coupled with observations from our divers that were going out, we defined three main pathways of impact of the fine sediment and associated nutrients in the inshore Great Barrier Reef. And I don't have time to give you all the examples here, but I can just pr present them here, is the increased suppression of light in, in shallow turbid water environments. So in environments around five to 10 metres depth. And these, we actually noticed these both during the period of the flood plume and in the months afterwards. And this reduces or suppresses the light for extended periods of time. Secondly, the other sites recorded more of a pulse delivery and deposition of the sediment with the highest concentrations of turbidity measured during the flood plume period, but we didn't see that increase in turbidity in the period afterwards. However, in the months following, we actually saw an increase in macroalgal growth at those inshore reef sites. So the example there is our Havana Island site in the months following. 
The good news there is the months following that and subsequent coming into 2020, that macroalgae actually went away and the corals started to recover quite well. And three, the development of sort of persistent turbidity issues like the Sunday Island example um, from the sediment being stirred up from the bottom or the delivery of the new sediment. And here, just um, we were able to show that a change in the suspended sediment concentration or the suspended particulate matter concentration in the water of only about half to one milligram per litre, which sounds very, very low, reduced water clarity by more than half. So like Seki disc depth went from like about nine metres in about half a milligram per litre down to about four metres in that one to one and a half milligrams per litre concentration. So pretty big changes. Just as an example of the first one, which I think we can show pretty nicely in the logger data, the increased light suppression as a Cleveland Bay example. Here's our logger data, the Burdekin uh, flood. Uh, but however, in our logger data, we actually see this very high increase in turbidity in the period around December, early January, prior to the 2019 floods. And this happened to be a very big resuspension event in Cleveland Bay associated with the path of ex-cyclone Penny. And coinciding with that event, you can see the light logger completely dropped out. So there was no light in this site in five metres water depth. It's a, it's a um, key seagrass meadow area in Cleveland Bay for 15 days. Then not long after that, we had our big floods from the Burdick and in Townsville regions, where we had no light in the logger at the seafloor for 17 days. And then in the period afterwards, with quite low wave energy conditions, even though when they start a little bit of waves, we start seeing much higher turbidity than we had seen in the previous period. And again, increased light suppression over those quite a few months periods following that 2019 floods. So what does that mean for the seagrass meadows? Well, we've worked pretty closely with Kath Collier and her team um, as a collaboration with another nest project and to look at how these changing sediment loads will imp influence a seagrass meadow. And this is just an example from a previous published work of the seagrass meadow area in Cleveland Bay. The different colours represent different seagrass species. But you can see, following the consecutive big discharge years from the Burdekin in 2007, 2008 and 2009, you start seeing that contraction of the seagrass meadow around that deep, those deeper sections of the bay. It's probably what we would hypothesise would be that reduction of light in those deeper areas and the seagrass meadow areas has contracted. I'll move on now. The other thing that our sediment traps provided is we started to get a continuous record of how the sediment caught in our trap changed over time. So this actually showed us that, this is an example from our Dunk Island traps. So this top panel is the sediment accumulation rates over each of the deployments um, shown a little bit differently here, but and the highlights hopefully you can see there are the periods where that site received a flood plume. So the periods that received a flood plume coincided with the highest accumulation rates in the sediment traps. Um, and the other interesting thing is, is the highest nutrients of total organic carbon and total nitrogen were in the traps coinciding with the flood plume period. And the other final thing is, is these large sediment flock aggregates that we measure in our flood plumes, we were only seeing in the sediment traps that coincided when that site received the, the flood plume waters. So it's sort of a, a, a link between what's come off in the newly delivered sediment that's being captured in our sediment traps. So just, just to very quickly touch on, this is a conceptual diagram that um, we've just published. This should be out in the next few days. This is led by Zoe and um, very nicely shows, whoops, sorry, I will go back one. Um, very nicely shows how the, this is the bucket of waters as you collect it across the transect of the flood plume. You can see the sediment concentrations in the buckets reduce greatly as you move further offshore. And we start to see the microscope images um, coinciding with those samples as the sediment flocks start to grow from these, what we'd call small mud flocks into these much larger sediment flock aggregates towards the end of the primary, what we call the primary plume or turbid plume waters and out into those more greener secondary flood plume waters. So we've defined that and based on 
this collection of flood plume data over the years, we can show that it's really this less than 20 micron sediment fraction that's preferentially being transported in the flood plume waters, and this is what we need to start focusing on in the catchment. Some very early data looking at the um, flood plumes where they've been a bit more dispersed throughout the water column, we're potentially starting to see a preference of transport for smectite clays, but that's still in the very early days. I'm not sure if Zoe would even want me to say that, but I, like, I'm starting to get more convinced about it, so I'm just going to say it. Sorry, Zoe, I've gone rogue. Um, and just finally, I just wanted to illustrate our new sediment collection methods and our ability um, you know, what the NESP has given us to get out and really just react very quickly. We saw a, a, the big floods in 2019. We went out in a helicopter and started capturing a whole series of images at Old Reef that you would, would have seen. These are quite powerful messages to, you know, to present to the landholders to show that this is where the flood waters are moving out into the Great Barrier Reef. In this case, it moved directly offshore, which is probably about a one in 15 year return interval that we've we suggest, and we're able to go out there and, and sample that sediment using our SETI pump, which is like a one micron filtration system. And you can see this is what the water looks like if you just grab a bucket, and this is what it looks like after two hours of pumping with the SETI pump. So that water, the sediment in that water looks exactly the same as the sediment that you'd grab out of, out of, in a bucket at the, off the end of the burdekin. That water, the sediment's just more dispersed through that water. So it's still there, but it's dispersed. And the other thing we're able to do is that's at the surface. We also did the SETI pump in 10 metres depth at that site to show that that sediment is dispersed throughout the whole water column there. And in this case, um, the Seki disc depth was about one and a half metres, so it was quite um, suppressed at that time. So I know we thank you again for persisting with me. I think I will leave it there, and I think they'll probably show the video of the project, so I'll get off the stage. But again, thanks for persisting, and hopefully we can chat over lunch. Thanks, Stephen. <clears throat>